Many thanks for staying with us and welcome back to the morning show here on Rise News. Before we went on that break, we promised to be back for a continuation of discussion on the global ascendancy of the Afrobeats music brand. And joining us for all of that now is Obi Asika, founder and chief executive officer of Storm 360, an indigenous record label that has spawned a lot of Nigerian entertainers. Obi has worked as executive producer of many TV shows and events like Big Brother Niger, Doctor's Quarters, Dragon's Den Nigeria, The Apprentice Africa, 100% Nigeria, Ninja Sings, and a lot more. He currently produces Journey of the Beats. Welcome to the program, Obi. Thanks a lot. Good to see you. Same here. Same You're here. Welcome, my brother. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> nah, man, it's man, been it's, a journey, isn't it? It's a serious journey, man. Journey of the Beats. The Journey of the now Beats. Now on Showmax. On Showmax. And, and also on Africa Magic. On well. Africa Magic, yeah, too. Yeah. Oh, nice. Are we getting there? I mean, because, you know, now we're talking about our own yeah. success story. Tell us about the journey of the beats. It was commissioned by Showmax? Yeah, we have to thank Showmax for making it possible, first of all. Mm. You know, and it's like, you know, yes, I mean, I, I, it's my concept. I pitched it. Okay. But the team, we had a team of like at least, my crew is at least 60 people wow. that worked in Lagos. We shot in Lagos. We shot in Abuja. We shot in Port Harcourt. We shot in Onetcha. We were in London. We are in Ghana. We are in, we in America. We are in Cuba. Wow. Some of the collaborators, I mean, people from South Africa, you know, Ed Kizo, Sheshwan Adeniji, Mark Redguard, yeah. you know, the team, Amate, my commissioning editor. So it's a collective effort. And really what, I, what we try to do is to tell the story of the evolution, mm. you know, of the journey, of the genres, of the sounds, of the people that made it happen. Not just the artists, but the people behind, the promoters, the influencers, mm. you know. And there's so many stories, yeah. you know, and you know how it is, it's endless. So I'm just happy that we actually got it out yeah. <laughs> because getting it out is hard, but you're always paying. There's some things you left on the cutting floor, you know. Ten, ten episodes, right? Ten episodes, I, yeah. What the first two. Yeah. I hope you, you liked you it. You started <laughs> like from the... The, the, the story of the slavery, isn't it? Yeah, pre-colonial. Pre-colonial, was yeah. that deliberate? 100%, because I think one of the things we wanted to really establish is that our music is not incidental, mm. right? Music is in our DNA. It's not just entertainment, yeah. right? In our original culture, music is ritual. We use music for burial, we use it for death, we use it for celebration. And we use it in all these forms and functions. And call and response in our original music is the same theme that is carried through slavery to all music in the Western world. Mm. So really for me, it's about taking ownership. To say that in the Caribbean, when we arrive, everything changes. In America, when we arrive, everything changes. And all those expressions that come out of there, they also came back. Because a lot of Africans came back from Brazil, from the Caribbean to Africa at the turn of the 19th century. And they come into Ghana, then they come to Nigeria, and that's where we need to see high life, right? right? So that evolution, that journey, it's important to understand that and to understand its connected culture. Yeah. So that's really, those are some of the themes that drive the journey of the beats. I mean, I like the fact that you even brought in, you know, the story of the entertainment sector, in, you know, in a larger context. Mm -hmm. Even the media personalities who are part of it. Oh. You know, when I watched the second episode, yeah. you know, the, the, the contributions of the OGBC, OGTV, Rapa, oh. you know. I mean, I know, of course, a lot of people in engaging with it would say, what happened to <laughs> BCOS somewhere? What happened to LTV? They, you know, yeah, but then... You, you didn't get everybody's name, but the thing exactly, about it is that yeah. when, when Nigeria liberalized broadcast mm. and really began to change that whole context of local content, there are outliers all over Nigeria. And that's the thing we kept seeing. Over the years, there are outliers who are driving this movement, who are saying, look, man, we're going to get this music on air. When does the sound change? When does the production change? So whether it's Lauli Akins in the 80s with Shino Peters, whether it's Nelson Brown with what he was doing with Plantation Boys, whether it's OJB, whether it's Down Jazzy, Cobhams, you know, there's, there's just a lot of talent. And there's a lot of people who have contributed. And it's just trying to sort of tell a holistic story to celebrate everybody, because for me, it's a movement. This, my, our documentary is like a bed, yeah. right? We want people to come into the bed, experience it, and hopefully storytellers can go and tell more stories from every other way, from original dramas to biopics to specials, because the truth of the matter, and the sad thing for me, is this is just the music, right? We haven't told stories about anybody in Nigeria. Mm. You know, so this is, I mean, I, you know what I mean? I talk about yeah. this with you. It's like, where's Nollywood, football, sports, politics, governance? Nothing. And I, I refuse to believe we haven't created thousands of great Nigerians mm. whose stories need to be told and celebrated right. and we can engage them and hopefully we start from here. Right. See what happens. Right. One of the topics that I thought was very well fleshed out in this doc, I've not gone 
so far into it, but from what I've seen so far was the scourge of um, piracy yeah. back then. Mm -hmm. And I say back then because I'm going somewhere with this question. <laughs> it was sort of almost painted as a necessary evil in a way that almost as though its existence pretty much took revenues out of the mouths of artists, but it also served in the same vein as a creative solution for distribution. Well, yeah, I mean, I, the thing is this, is like, when you look at, and, and that's a real good question, I've got to tell you, because when you look at it, I used to call the pirates gap marketing, right? Um, for a long time, a lot of us were putting out music with really, no real way of getting any revenue from the music. So you really, you know you're doing promotion to bring attention, and then you get to the, because it's, it's show business, right? So we have to validate the show before we could get to the business. Okay. Now we're in the business phase, and you're beginning to see revenues. But sales and distribution is still a mirage on the streets of Nigeria, mm -hmm. because basically what happened when the international labels were here, they didn't invest, okay? They were operating, operating a sort of rentier approach with no real local distribution, which was run through really Malu Road, okay? I remember when we first <laughs> tried to do a deal with Sony Music yeah. and Auntie KG, you know, I signed Junior and Pretty, and they distributed, yes, and legend, and they distributed us. And the biggest distributor in Nigeria was an Igbo lady, Papa, Mrs. Okoro, who was distributing, and it was cassettes, right? And they were distributing, and it's crazy when you think about it. So we've come from those, that sort of place, then into a Dumontan Alaba, yeah. where you would go to meet T. Joe and Obino and these guys, because yeah. those guys, you can't tell the story without them. I tried to get yeah. some of them on the show, but they didn't really want to talk, to be honest. <laughs> T. Joe didn't want to be on, but, they're like the marketers in Nollywood. Yeah, yeah, they stay exactly. behind. They, they stay behind. And they determine what yeah, happens. Yeah, but they were critical because before social media, they moved our music across West Africa, yeah. right? Before the big, before Channel O, which is key in our story, yeah. Yeah, it really gave us a platform into the continent, then MTV base. So this is kind of what happened here from here. What would you like in that situation back then to today? Is there a necessary evil today? Today, listen, we're still in a situation where the biggest opportunity for Afrobeats is still in Nigeria, right? Because whilst we're globalizing, which is great, yeah, our domestication of the economy, of the influence and the attention that we've generated has to build. So you have to get product, commodities, touring, more events, sort out publishing. That's what you do in your domestic environment. Because what has happened, which I think people have to really understand and appreciate, is this thing, this music that we've created is, I call it Afrobeats culture. Yeah. It's beyond music, right? And what has really happened is they've really probably achieved over a billion followers worldwide today, yeah. right? That attention is a whole economy. Now, to monetize that economy, we have to productivize it, we have to commoditize it and put it into the thing. And there are domestic platforms. So it's not just for me. One of the key things is to tell our own stories as well so that you get that perspective of what we did, because we were intentional. Nothing that has happened with all of this stuff is random. It you, is you, driven by us. You made that point when a uh, piece, I am Osigwe and Afa, mm -hmm. you know, had one of the series of, yeah. you know, uh, and you spoke, you know, via Zoom. Mm -hmm. We have expanded. Afrobeats, as you said, has become a culture, yeah. and it has gone global. But then where is the music? Mm -hmm. where, is the, where, where is the business component of it? Where is the money? Otherwise, you said, yes, let's consolidate here. But then the kind of uh, success that people are celebrating mm -hmm. seems to be coming from outside. Well, Filling up the big concert spaces, mm -hmm. you know, um, having a major record you know, deal like Bonner Boy is doing. But here, if you are not getting picked up by the brands, you know, and you are not, you know, streaming, it looks like there's really nothing going on. I, I, think, I think you've got to understand the dynamics, right? The first thing is that artists out of Lagos in 2022 can blow global out of Lagos on day one, mm. right? This is not something that was ever possible in every time prior to this time. Part, a lot of this is to do with our virality in social media and our numbers. Now, in terms of opportunities, when I say the biggest is here, WizKids sold out to Afro Nation is on this weekend. On. You know, those are my people. That's a huge event. But guess what? Portugal. Yeah, but guess what? We can do Afro Nation in every state in Nigeria, right? We have 40 stadiums. We have 400 universities and colleges, right? The brands just need to wake up and understand this is not like when we started. When we started this thing, it was in the early, late, mid-90s, early 2000s, we were convincing brands to come and do promotion, right? So glue this, MTN this, MTN that. No, 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 no. Now you've got to go on tour. So where's the WizKid tour in Nigeria? Okay, that's how you domesticate. Do you understand what I'm saying? So really, well, I used to say to P Square, that how can you retire and leave billions on the table? 
are so happy they're back together because they need to, you know, they're back together, the Afro Nation. For their own good. No, and even for everybody else because the band is still relevant, right? Yes. You understand? Flavor is a god. These guys, it's music, it depends. You can have a 20 year career. You understand? Yeah. Whiskey, David, and, and Berna are all approaching like 10 years. They're not first. Out. Rima and all these guys yeah. are the guys that are like two years. Yeah. Do you understand? So we're seeing the evolution of the sound. We're seeing the evolution. And we saw, I mean, we saw Fireboy at the BT Awards. Yes. We spent a lifetime trying to see our guys on stage at the main events, not in the side event and being awarded off camera, off broadcast. Mm. You know, these are the things that you, you were talking about world, world music. I fought world music as a categorization for our music for years mm. because world music is at the back of the record store. We were bringing young, hot guys. That's right. Like, no, you're not going to project our guys as folk music or cultural music. We're in the club. We want to be, and my guys are sex symbols. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it sounds funny now, but in 20, 2000, people look at you like, are you mad? But I remember in 2019 being at the Wizkid concert at the O2, That's and it's sold out, and Angie Stone is playing the smaller venue, mm. right? And it's 2,000 people, sold out. And I said, look at life. 20 years ago, we couldn't convince Angie Stone or D'Angelo to talk to our guys. That's right. Now they can't sell out the venue that we're selling out the full building. That's the what, journey. What did we get right? And what <laughs> do we need to do to sustain it? Otherwise we get carried away by, by success. Well, the thing is, is I think we've, we've got to not be complacent. I keep telling the Nigerians, you know, don't think it's forever. I remember when, you remember when the DRC sound was dominant here? You remember when the Ghana sound was dominant here? You know, and my piano is kind of, maybe it's become Niger piano now. I don't know, I don't, I don't know what's going on. But I think don't be complacent, keep staying fresh. Mm. But Nigerians have this ability, we have this thing, this USP, that we affect everything we touch, right? Yeah. And that's something that people don't really harness. And because we affect everything we touch, our energy infects everywhere. So you see it now globally, the music, the fashion, the dance, mm. the food, right? All these things are globalizing at the same time. Yeah. Now, it's for the rest of the country here to step up and understand that's our real power. And I call it the soft power, but it's the real power of Nigeria. It's our culture, it's our music, our food, our dance, our fashion. Every Nigerian has a fashion, personal fashion designer. They just call it their tailor. <laughs> you mentioned the brands earlier. What, what is it, it's what's stopping the brands from buying into this? Afro tour, Niger Nigerian tour vision? Is it because of the global visibility sells first and then we bring it home? Well, because, I think what it yeah. is is this, everybody's affected by everything, right? And over time, don't forget we're coming out of COVID, we're coming out of two years of almost being locked down. So I think this Christmas, Afro Nation Ghana will be big. In Nigeria, you're going to see more festivals, you're going to see more events. There's a huge venue being built behind the Palms, which is going to be a 10,000 capacity venue. I think that venue is going to change everything in terms of live events in Lagos. Who's behind that? Um, I think uh, the owner of the bomb, oh, Chitaya Musho. Oh, Chitaya. Yeah, yeah, it's a really, I mean, that's a special project. The NBA team, I believe, will be in that venue as well. So that's a multi-event venue that will give us the kind of venue where you can do the O2 in Lagos, right? So you have all these things coming. And I would say that in Nigeria, you want to be in a situation where touring and merchandise are the two key things that I really want to see grow. Because if you, do, if you sort out touring and merchandise, you monetize everybody, mm. right? What you were talking about, but there are domestic platforms, they do UDX, mm. there's Audio Mac. Just on Audio Mac, I think Wizkid and Burner Boy did 100 million streams in wow. Nigeria in one year. That's one platform. There's another 100. So that for us, it's still growth. There's still a huge growth opportunity. And getting to the money, which is what everybody's trying to get to, yeah. is the whole target right now using the tools that exist in social media, all those digital tools to say, okay, we've got attention. How do we convert it to money? To money. I think that's anybody in the music business or in the entertainment business, that's part of what they're thinking about, right? And that's what you've got to focus on. Yeah. Your, your documentary uh, created, you know, copious space mm -hmm. for veterans. Yes. Uh, Uncle Jimmy Shilanke will be 80 tomorrow, and I know that you are going to say <laughs> something to me about that, you know, uh, that brilliant, talented, you know, young 80-year-old man, <laughs> you know. Uh, what, uh, was that deliberate? And, and what are your thoughts no, no, on I mean, Uncle we, Jimmy we try to get to everybody. We, you know, we interviewed over 400 people, but even when you interview them over an hour each, the amount they get into the episode is, is reduced, right? So... I was on set when he was being interviewed and you know, the man is a legend. I'm just, I'm just in awe listening. And we had asked him, um, so when did you first encounter music? Mm. 
And this man is sitting there casually and he goes, I wrote a number one record for Roy Chicago when I was 14. Wow. So I'm just like, I'm looking at this man like, <laughs> wow. Because he, he was in secondary school yeah. in 1949. Mm. And it, I mean, even when he said it, nobody on the set was born maybe 20 years before <laughs> he said it. So just thinking about that and his story mm. and so many others like him, you know, and this thing we'll talk about Afrobeat and Afrobeats. Mm. Some of them violently opposed to the word, right? Afrobeats was that. Some, they understand its evolution. And I would just say to them, listen, it's all about generations. Every generation thinks their stuff is the hottest, right? And what's happened to me is that hip hop culture invaded the world. And when it invaded Nigeria, when yeah. we domesticated hip hop, yes. it became Afrobeats. That's right. Okay, that's, what, that's the journey of the beats. You, and you, you have said, to say. So, you said somewhere that whoever added that S to Afrobeat deserves an award, something like that. Well, that must be a genius. Yeah, because we were all sitting there. I'm telling you, in the, eight, in the 2000s, we're walking around the world. What's, what are we calling ourselves? <laughs> Is it Afro hip hop? Is it Afro pop? Is it all these things you're talking and, and you're like, but it just wasn't working. Is it Beidou? Can white people pronounce Beidou? I mean, you know, all these things. But at the <laughs> so end of the day. This name, this tag, oh, look, this stuck. appellation has come to stay. It's stuck. It's 10 years now. And it's like, it was some journalist, I think, in the UK, and it was off the BBC so One DJ, Extra show. DJ Abrante. Abrante, Abrante, I interviewed him, right? <laughs> okay. And Abrante, and, you know, Abrante is incredible. And yes, it's him. He popularized it. Yes. Yeah, but there are other people. And I think it's just a collective phrase now. Because now Afrobeats, frankly, and my piano is almost part of Afrobeats, right? That's what I'm saying. What makes you, what makes you an Afrobeats artist? And, and why, why are we trying to generalize it? Well, it's simply because you've got to understand music has been sold through formatting for years, right? In the, in the, in the older era, you couldn't even get on radio if you were not in a particular format. That's right. It's only been in the last three years that Afrobeats as a format has been able to get onto radio in America. So upon all the social media stuff to get onto radio, which is where music is really pushing, yeah. it's about formatting. So they're looking at the format, they're going, okay, we've got some R&B, we've got some hip hop, yeah. we've got some country, we've got some gospel blues and soul, that's why it's like that. So we just had to find a format because whilst we love African music and traditional music and cultural music, that's not hot in the club. So Afro beats is urban, young African sounds with an attitude that is in that Nigerian DNA. That is the real thing that is being pushed. And that attitude in our DNA, the swag, whatever they want to call it, that's the thing. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think that because that Nigerian thing is a USP, it's global. Everybody knows when the Nigerians are in the building, right? Yeah. And before, it's like we used to almost deny it. I see Nigerians worldwide living almost in denial that, oh, I'm not really Nigerian. My name is Michael. Oh, no, 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 no. Everybody today is Niger. And I think that's a great thing. Right. I mean, now that we're talking about the business side of, of, of stuff, let's look at the internal dynamics of the industry itself. Yeah. And I'm going to approach this from an artist management mm. perspective. Now, we all know that's a very crucial relationship. Yeah. Some people would even say this could make or mar the career of an artist. Some will argue it could also do the same for the manager. Mm -hmm. What are some of the cardinals here for both parties to, in, before approaching that kind of relationship? Well, the first things first is typically if any artist that's coming up um, as you're starting, find somebody in your team that really believes in you. Because you've got to have a, a manager is really your first evangelist, right? That's your personal manager. He's got to be your first evangelist. It's got to be the person that believes that you're God's next choice. Yeah. Because if you don't have that in your team, you can't win. Because somebody has to believe that, right? Because when you're alone in your bedroom, just sitting on your own and writing up and coming up with your stuff, nobody knows you somebody has to also believe in you. So that's the first thing, is finding that person that believes in you. And then hoping that person has the right relationships and personality to gain access. Because the first thing is relationships and access, right? Can you access people? Can you talk to people? So relationship, access, integrity is key, right? But then also understanding the business. Because the business has changed. 20 years ago, artists could get signed just being, on being talented. Today, you very much have to be a self-starter. Mm. You have to have generated some buzz. You've got to get some followers. You've got to have some music out there people are paying attention to. So you've generated a little kind of movement and momentum that bigger people want to jump onto. And that's what happens. So whether it's a, a distribution deal, a publishing deal, a label deal, or a management deal, they've seen what you're doing and they want to engage. And that's what happens. 
So that these are just, I mean, I hope that helps. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. But okay, corporates have shown interest. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, IELTS is on Netflix, mm -hmm. Showmax commission yours. Uh, I know that Sheung Bankuli is mm -hmm. working on something. Yes, yes. You know, so there are activities, um, almost self-made by the industry. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that, you know, which, which, which holes do you think that uh, the government can step, into. can step into knowing your close relationship with the two uh, key important people that matter, the Honorable Minister, uh, mm -hmm. Lajilai Mohamed, the DG of the uh, Tourism Corporation, mm -hmm. Foley Coca. You mm -hmm. know, which other areas do you think that they can, you know, uh, key into to assist? Well, I mean, they, I think they, they're doing what they can. I think part of what I would say is this, is that, um, first of all, even I have to thank the DG, Foley Coca. He made available some content to us, which we used in the, in the series. I think that I mean, for me, the music industry specifically has never really gotten much support. I, I don't think it's something that I say all the time. It's always about Nollywood, you know, which is fine. No yeah, disrespect yeah. to Nollywood. Yeah, louder, probably more vociferous. I don't know whether <laughs> I don't know whether they are, but but the honest truth is that the music industry is more is perhaps more entrepreneurial. Mm. So nobody waits for anything. That's right. Guys are self starters. They just get up and go. And maybe we're all slightly crazy because there's no real thing that tells you that you should have a you should become successful. So the music people don't wait for anything and they go. But I think where we would love to see support for sure is that in terms of sorting out and enabling infrastructure, right? We definitely need more venues where we can perform, right? Venues are the key because that enables more live yeah. and enables touring. So as I said earlier, you've got 400 universities, you've got 40 stadiums in Nigeria. It would be great to develop a national tour, right? I mean, imagine a tour with Wiskin and David and Berner headlining, doing 30 stadiums. That's, that, that economic activity is going to be enormous, right? So, and these are the sort of things that government can actually be part of by just by being you know, proactive and progressive. And I think that is the sort of thing we want to see. Obviously, coming out of the pandemic mm -hmm. and the security situations we have also affect some of these things. But I think that the biggest thing we would also want to see is to how can we get discovery, for me, is perhaps the biggest challenge in Nigeria. How do you discover the new talent? talent. Right? Where's the pipe from if you're sitting in Kafanchan or you're sitting in Oware, how do you get to national prominence, right? How because we have we're blessed in this country. We have people sitting in every inch of Nigeria that are talented, but their opportunity to go from where they are to be visible is very, very limited. Mm. Right. So that is another big opportunity to build a national discovery platform mm. that government can feed into. So I think it's not really about necessarily because in the music industry, it's not necessarily about funding mm -hmm. because a lot of the stuff is taking care of yeah, itself. Yeah. But it is about helping sort out the CMO situation, which is critical, yeah. so that royalties and collections can happen properly. Right. Publishing as well. These are things that government can help with. Mm -hmm. But in terms of enabling the ecosystem, what we want to see is venues. We want to see the ability to, for places like Abba to create product. Because if you've got a billion people having attention, and we've got a place like Abba that's making product for West Africa. Mm. We should have already, but I don't know whether the government's gonna roll or whether we just have to do it ourselves because we've always done it ourselves. Yes, right. So I think the sector has to kind of just keep on going on. And at some point in time, that's what we've always done. So it's not like anybody waited for anybody. Mm. You just keep going. And if they catch up, they catch up, right? The story, I heard you say something earlier. I said, is the story, are we there yet? We're just starting. Mm. We're just starting. We're just starting. I mean, and again, looking at the economic potential of these points that you just laid out, it's still a no-brainer to me why the government is not invested in all of this infrastructure. It sounds like you know massive revenue potentially sitting on the table. So that begs me to. I, I'm really curious about what is it that the industry has not given the government. I don't think there's anything. Information-wise, I don't think there's anything the industry hasn't given the government. I mean, people like me, we've been engaging for 20 years. The issue is whether the political will is there to follow through. Mm. It's always the same issue, right? Because in Nigeria, even till tomorrow, uh, Nigerians, you know, when you come to the big man level, Nigerians are still giving prominence to oil and gas, right? And we believe that that's the future and solves everything. But I'll tell you something. I mean, I led the technical working group for the National Development Plan for the sector. And by 2030, the creative industries, culture, hospitality, and tourism, of course, music is part of that, yeah. fashion is part of that, Nollywood is part of that. Those sectors will be $100 billion per annum in this country without whether government says yes or yes. no. By 2030? Yeah, by 2030. So that's, that's the Nigerian opportunity. If you step into it, 
is 200 billion. Do you understand? And yeah. I didn't talk about the digital economy, by the way, right? So these things are happening with or without. It's not about politics. It's not about anything. It's about the energy of the people, what they're creating, what they're producing, and what we're consuming as a nation. And that is happening. So you're 100% right. The business model is there. It's a worldwide thing. And hopefully we can all key in as a country because I think that our biggest strength and capacity and opportunity is actually our story. And this one is just a, a little, little piece of it. Biasika, we want to thank you so much for, <laughs> Thanks for having joining us this morning. Nice and congratulations me. on the journey of the beats. Just keep watching. It's, it's a bit, we'll, we'll, I'll watch Definitely. the entire edition, the entire right. episode. Yeah, we'll come back and talk about it again. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> nice thank you so much. Thanks. Thank All you, right. Habib.